All right, thank you. And you'll know why I was urging you to sit down when you hear this message. Turn to the book of Exodus, if you would. Let's get there quickly. First of all, let me just say thank you to Tiffany and to Miata and to the teams and the worshipers and the attendees. And wow, what a moment. Thank you. You know, you, you could do a little bit better than that. There we go. For the messages this morning so far, absolutely powerful. And I want to start by just praying for us. Can I do that? Jesus, empower us to hear well. We have to be empowered by your spirit to receive anything from you. And we have to be empowered by your spirit to hear by the spirit. As Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we can see you better and know you better. So Lord, in these few minutes that we have, help us here in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Exodus 33, Danielle, also one of my very favorite passages of scripture because Moses is one of my, if not the most favorite character of scripture. Because what we find in Moses is a man whose relationship with God was pretty singularly unique. You hear words like friend, mouth to mouth, breath to breath, the original language says, as a man speaks with his friend. And while the rest of the nation was peeking out from their tents, Moses was in fellowship with God. Something unique about this man and what he had carved out with God was powerful. And this beautiful passage that Danielle preached from this morning so ably, show us your presence. If you don't go with us, please don't even send us. Because it's the only thing that distinguishes us from all the other peoples on the, world, on the planet. And could I submit to you that it is that same presence of God that's the only thing that distinguishes the church from every other group of nice people that gather together. It's God in their midst. But I want to pick up right where Danielle left off. Don't you love how the Holy Ghost weaves all this together? Verse 18 Then Moses said, Moses has made his request to God. God has heard. God has said, absolutely, I'll do that which you have asked of me. And then Moses presses the envelope a bit. He says, then he says, now, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I'll cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I'll proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, compassion on whom I have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. He said, but there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock, and when my glory passes by, I'll put you in that cleft in the rock, cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I'll remove my hand, and you'll see my back, but my face must not be seen. Moses, pressing in, pressing through. His intercession not only for himself, but for his nation, uniquely heard because God says, I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. Declining angelic assistance to not only possess blessing, but to have God himself. I'll come back to that in a moment. But Moses understood the difference between his current experience of God God's presence and a greater manifestation of God now show me your glory. 
Moses understood that whatever he had, as great as it was, as precious as it was, as unique as it was, there was still something Moses understood. I'm not getting the whole picture here. There's more. And if Moses could discern that difference and desire the expression of God's person, I pose this question to you and to me this afternoon. Should not that be our pursuit as well? Let me dig down a bit. God offered to send an angel. He'll drive out all the inhabitants. He'll take you in. Angelic implementation and orientation. I was in a church years ago and was in worship and something just seemed a little off. Couldn't quite figure it out. And I mean, everything from the stage was exactly right. I mean, they had excellence. They had the, the singers and the musicians. and It was carefully honed and choreographed, but something was wrong. And I stepped outside for a moment to inquire of God. And I said, what's happening here? He said, I sent an angel for them to worship, and they don't know the difference. It terrified me. Last year, I was at an international gathering of prophets. And prominent on the stage was set a huge set of angel wings. And for hours, I never heard the Bible read. Never heard the name of Jesus mentioned. Never heard the Holy Spirit referenced. But I heard a lot about angels. You see, you can experience, angels can, bring, can deliver both proclamation and promise. But what they can't do is bring you to the person of God himself. And you'll find right now in the body of Christ a tremendous emphasis on angels. Just be aware as prophetic men and women. And the tragedy is when we settle for an angel rather than God himself. When we stop in our revelation and experience of God based on blessing as an affirmation that all is good and all is well. But then we get to the presence of God. Presence of God, excuse me. We love the presence of God. Never want to diminish it. Because it's with that presence that we have fellowship. We have friendship, including communication, intimacy. And there's benefits of that fellowship and relationship. But you know, you can experience someone's presence, but not yet really know the fullness of their person. You know, I can experience a person's presence by a gift that they've given me, and I can look at that gift, and there's a remembrance of that individual. I can kind of experience their presence by a gift left behind. Or I can read a letter, maybe, that someone left or wrote to me. And it can be a great letter, and all of a sudden, I'm brought back into that person's presence. But that person is not there. You see where I'm going with this. It's why spirit-empowered folks who believe and practice gifts, even gifts are not a substitute. Likewise, even the book, the inspired and living word of God, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in John 5 and then said, you think that by the scriptures you possess eternal life, yet these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have that life. In other words, yes, you've got the scriptures, good for you, but you're still missing that it's about me. Yeah, yeah. This is what the book is about. The book is a book about God, to draw us to God. Yeah. Hmm. Sometimes we define that presence as the demonstration of God's power. Paul stated that the basis of his testimony was what a demonstration of power. I didn't just come to you with great preaching, wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. 
all good. And I don't diminish any of that. But like Moses, I think there's more. Beyond just presence, beyond just power, beyond just P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, there's more. To discover, define, and desire, what is this glory? And that word glory is a theological challenge. And I've spent some time studying this. Scholars and theologians and both ancient and and, and contemporary grapple with what is this glory of God that the Bible speaks of. It's, It's one of those terms that we use many times, but we don't step back and really try to define the term as one is appropriate from what the Scripture tells us and then what it really is. It's like defining light to a person devoid of sight or trying to describe a song to someone that's deaf. Only the most vague description and comparisons begin to explain the unexplainable. The best we can do with, well, it's kind of like, like tastes like chicken. (laughs) It's like defining beauty. Every one of us have a definition of what beauty is, but if I try to give you my definition or my aesthetic, it's going to fall short, regardless of how well I can craft it or wordsmith it. Defining perfection without competition. Defining holiness without limitation. This is glory. And I'm going to give you the definition that I've crafted for this message. The teachers and theologians here, feel free to just tear this to pieces after I'm done. Because I'm creating a definition for the context of this conference, but it's not without study. The glory of God is the full manifestation, full manifestation of God's holiness, perfection in person. professor from London College of Divinity expressed it like this. As one reflects upon the concept of goodness, one fact becomes apparent. God, in the moral sense, exists only in conjunction with personality. Moral goodness can only exist for personal minds. The ideal of absolute goodness can only exist in a mind from which all reality is derived. Goodness cannot be explained on naturalistic or evolutionistic terms. Which brings me now to this question. Why are we not pressing in for glory rather than just presence? And I'm going to give you one word, and I believe it's the word benefit. Benefit. You see, we experience presence and there's something symbiotic. I get something from the encounter. Come on. And listen to me quickly, saints. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with the fact that we come into God's presence, whether it's through study or intercession or or worship in song, whatever the means and the mechanisms are, there's nothing wrong with something coming back to us. But I believe the glory of God is uniquely about him. It has little to nothing to do with us. You see, there are benefits, again, to presence. Don't get... (laughs) The psalmist, praise the Lord, and what? Forget not all his... There we go. We are instructed not to forget the benefits of God. But let me say to you, it's not just recanting everything God's done for us. That is an insufficient worship. Oh, maybe it will prime the pump in a moment. But the problem is when God stops performing to those same expectations, where does the worship go? Job, 
42 chapters of messing with him. God's own testimony about Job, have you considered? There's no one on the planet like him. He's righteous. He's my man. He's my guy. And then 42 chapters of tearing his life down, breaking it down. Why? Because Job's revelation of God was insufficient. In spite of a righteous life out of God's own mouth, his revelation was insufficient. Forget his wife. Forget his friends. They were idiots. (laughs) They weren't the ones suffering. Well, his family all died. That's another story. But the lengths that God will go to to bring a full orb revelation of who he is Yet will I praise you. The prophet Habakkuk said it this way in chapter 3. Though the fig tree doesn't bud, no grapes on the vines, that olive crop fails, fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, what does he say? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And it's this lack of apparent blessing that many times causes us to begin to turn. We go back to the original lie that came to the ears of man through the serpent. Is he really a good God? Is he really a good God because his blessings are being somehow withheld in your life in this particular moment? Do you realize many times God will purposely withhold blessing in your life to find out if worship will still be there? And it's this lack of blessing. We begin to bring accusation against God, and then we begin to turn. Come on. That's when we begin to craft other gods of our own imagination that are a whole lot easier to apprehend and appropriate and to get to do what we want them to do. And so the next thing you know, we're creating golden calves. So how do we do this? How do we move from presence to glory? And I want to give you five quick points. Because I believe that this is a worship that's truly reflective of heaven. The very first is there has to be A shift in orientation. The subject and the object must switch positions. So much of our worship somehow has benefit coming back to you and me. But there is a worship that we find around the throne that it all moves in one direction. One direction. Hmm. In other words... The shift has to be from gain to glory, from us to him. Is our worship simply an emotional exercise in which certain endorphins are released and we feel better about self and situation? If that's the case, then it's just worship, worship. It's not unlike the buzz that we get at a concert or a ball game. This is not about what happens in your Emotions and your body chemistry. Oh, I feel God. It's endorphins. <laughs> Just helping you out a little bit. Ascribe, the psalmist writes in chapter 96, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering, come into his courts, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And listen to this, tremble before him. Let me just tell you, trembling doesn't involve this. (laughs) Trembling involves, might I live through this? Number two, there has to be a shift of our demand of God constantly coming to us. God, come down. 
all. Last I checked, he already has. He came down. He returned. He sent his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is still here in us, among us. Amen? God's done his part of coming down. Amen? But now the question is, will we go up? The, emin- the, the eminence of God. God, we want you to come down. Get, get, get at eye level with me. Let me just tell you, you don't want God at eye level with you. You don't want God only as big as your current problem. You want to keep God big. Not just God getting inflated in a 911 moment in your life. You want God to stay in that place. And I preach this message around my table. My wife's sick of it. Because this is becoming a life message for me. If I've got to choose that God would be God rather than a friend, I'll let him be God every time. The same way that those of us that understand fatherhood, you'll have lots of friends, you're going to have one daddy. And if I've got to temporarily stop being your friend to be your father, I'll choose fatherhood every time. Wow. Come up. God's inviting us. Exodus 19, the Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and he did what? He called Moses to the top of the mountain. Matthew 17, Peter, James, John, the three amigos, the three knuckleheads are about to have an experience that very little flesh has ever seen and survived to talk about. Jesus is transfigured before them. One of them is talking about building tents and then heaven begins to talk. Next thing you know, they're on the ground. Hmm. Come up. Come up. And John's testimony of that moment we find in John 1. We have seen his glory. What do you think they're talking about? What they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. Wow. You see, we've got to expect that God's going to call us up to something. And not just call us up to mission, not just call us up to greater sanctification, but God is inviting his church, would you come up here with me? There's a different vantage point, not only of your situation, not only of yourself, but there's a different vantage point. You're going to see me in a way you've never seen before. But you've got to come up. The third point is soli deo gloria. God's glory alone will become our purpose and our priority. Myself and Pastor Mark Hawk are going to do a breakout this afternoon about prophetic worship. But let me just say by, by way of teaser, all true worship is prophetic worship. It's not a separate category. There should always be an element of the prophetic in every encounter of worship that we have. And in that priority, how we define our role in that changes. Exodus 40, Moses couldn't enter the tent. Why? Because the cloud had settled. The glory of the Lord filled it. Second Chronicles 7, you know this. The priest could not enter. Why? Because the glory of the Lord filled it. Let me just tell you, when the glory of God shows up, it's not going to be the celebrity worship leader. It's not going to be a slamming band. It's going to be Whew. It's going to be face planted. Am I, going to, am I going to live through this? And if you talk to people who've had true encounters with God, they're not dancing with angels. They're not cavorting. Yeah, God, now nah, we just had no... 
That's not their experience. Their experience is, I thought I was going to die. Come on. And one of the great five solas of the Protestant Reformation, one of them is soli deo gloria. To God alone be the glory. J.S. Bach, who wrote one or two tunes back in the day, Most of you are not familiar with him. You know, he didn't win a dove this year. It's going to be all right. But. but he inscribed on most of his music, SDG, Solo Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. 1 Corinthians 1, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that is it's written. He who glories, let him glory what? In the Lord. Number four, gravitas. I quote another theologian. Augustine often spoke of the gravitas of worship. We worship a weighty Lord. So we must always consider whether the worship we offer is light or weighty. Does our worship reflect the full significance of all of God's attributes, or does it just treat him merely as our best pal? To glorify God is to give him the honor he's due, so let us never offer anything less to him. Weight, gravitas. And what that does, it makes demands on us for right revelation and right response. Consider otherwise, this same same guy Moses, a friend of God, and yet one really bad choice. You remember what it was? He busted that rock. He struck that rock twice. Amazing. I hope this bothers you the same way it bothers me. And in that one moment of dishonoring God, one moment, Numbers 20, you didn't trust in me enough to what? Honor me as, come on, holy in the sight of the nation. You will not bring this community into the land I give them. Wow. This is Moses. Moses had some nephews, Nadab and Abihu. And we find that Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel in this rare moment went up and they had a meal with God and they lived to tell about it. And these young men at at, at this great ordination service, I mean, this this is a deal. It says they took unauthorized fire. I wish I had a couple of messages I could unpack on that. But unauthorized fire from the altar. Meaning they weren't doing it the way that God said, this is how it's done. This is how I want it done. And you know what happened? Fire came out from that very altar and killed those boys. Let me just tell you, being the nephews of Moses, being the sons of the great high priest Aaron, it didn't curry them any favor in that moment. Because they touched something. They touched something. This is what the Lord spoke. Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of the people, I will be honored. Isaiah, I saw the Lord. And then he got a real peek of, woe to me. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips I'm uh, uh, among unclean people and my eyes have seen God now God had a solution coals from the altar touched his lips purified him but Isaiah came to the recognition I've seen something that should kill me let me just tell you the gravitas of worship will bring us into a place of condition is it? Oh, wow. Not, oh, I'm a son. I get the stuff. It's, oh, 
oh, I've seen God. Oh, oh. And then the last point is volition is suspended. You know, worship is, for the most part, in our realm, it's optional. Come on. You have volition. You have a will. You can choose to worship, not worship. Pray, not pray. Study, not study. We, 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 we've been given this thing called free will that we think is such a gift, but you walk with God for a while and you realize, I'm not sure it's such a great gift. And in Revelation 7, we see a picture. It says, all. It doesn't say the ones that felt like it in the moment. Now, I know the angelic realm is uniquely wired to worship. I got that. But it says, all the angels standing around, elders, four living creatures, fell down before the throne and worshiped, saying, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to your God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You see, that manifestation of glory gives us a glimpse into his holiness, his perfection, his worth. And in that moment, worship is demanded. It's not a matter of, I got text to do. I don't like that song. I'm not going to sing that one. No, no, no. I, I, I'm going to let my obedience stay optional today because I'm, I'm, this is Monday. It's my day off. This, this, is, this is my Sabbath. I get a pass today. Because your worship extends way beyond what happens in this room. And in that moment, we begin to realize that our worship isn't optional. It's demanded. Anything, everything in creation has no choice but to do what? Face plant. Psalm 66, everything on earth will do what? Worship you. And they will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. And I believe this is another distinction between presence and glory. Is that when we get into God's glory, everything has to worship. Doesn't have a choice. The rocks will cry out. I was watching this piece, Pastor Brother, like this because he's smart and he watches stuff like this. <laughs> but that all of the planets and the heavenly bodies emit sound. They emit certain frequencies that equate to what you and I call pitch. And the scientist has put these together. And do you know what? The heavens are indeed declaring. Not just the beauty of the sunset, not just the wonder of his creation, Romans 1, so that men are without excuse, but the planets themselves are making noise and there has been forever worship going on. As they respond to that glory. Revelation 21, I didn't see a temple in this city. Because the Lord and the Lamb are its temple. The city doesn't need sun or moon to shine out. For the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. And the nations walk by it. The kings will bring their splendor, what? Into it. It means that whatever light they have is completely consumed by that other light. And on no day, and no day will give its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there, and the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Amen. I read an article, and I'll close with this. The name of the article, to give you some examples, is called The Depths of Solemn Grandeur. It's like, I'm not smart enough to read that. But quoting Philip Fechtiker, worship is a demanding discipline that has to do with the most profound experiences a human being can undergo. The fear, love, and trust that commingle when mortals confront the Holy One 
of Israel. Now show me your glory. Are we just pleased with his presence? Or are we groaning for glory? Pray with me. Jesus, help us in this moment. God, let us hear well, but respond better. And Lord, we don't diminish any experience that we ever have with you. God, to be a gatekeeper, it's enough. Our Lamb's written in the Lamb's book of life. Your Holy Spirit on the inside of us manifesting your paternity. God, we don't despise any experience that we've had or currently having, but God, like Moses, we want more. Not just more fame, not just more wealth, not just more blessing, God. We want your glory. So God, let us grant us that request. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bless you, church.